D'accord. Monsieur une illustre, une personne de bonne chance. Styriste Styriste Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so welcome to the session, Integrating E-Government uh, and Inspire. I'm Adam Daniel Nagy uh, from the Inspire team, uh, DG Environment. I am the, uh, the lawyer in the, the Inspire team, so if there are any infringements uh, actually coming your way, uh, uh, then it's uh, uh, coming from my pen, actually, uh, partially. Um, um, just as a general framework, uh, setting the scene, uh, we are very much uh, uh, connected to, to e-government, and uh, as we could um, hear uh, at the last session uh, by, by, um, by Mark, the, the French delegate, uh, Inspire is rather is a small, small piece of uh, legislation to actually uh, save the world and make a whole lot of uh, uh, difference uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, 
of uh, saving, saving the environment and uh, improving the environment. So uh, this is the reason we need to position our ourselves in terms of uh, the different priorities of the Commission. Uh, and here, here, here is where we are actually connected to the e-government, to the digital single market. Uh, there was a communication uh, on the strategy uh, for achieving the digital single market. Uh, it was adopted in uh, 2015. And uh, we managed to smuggle in some very, very important hooks as regards uh, the Inspire Directive um, in terms of interoperability and e-government. As, as a consequence of this, uh, we are actually uh, quite highlighted as a action 19, if I remember correctly, in the e-government uh, action plan that was uh, adopted uh, earlier this year. So. Um, um, in terms of this, it can be seen that uh, the different e-government objectives, uh, making the, uh, uh, the public services uh, more efficient, uh, uh, more digitized, more uh, uh, so service-oriented, um, these are very much in line with the Inspire objectives. Uh, one, the data sharing, so the government to gov government uh, data flows, and the other, other side, the, horizontal, uh, the, the vertical aspect, so the access to information to the public, so from the, from the public administration to the public. So we can see that the, uh, there's a very huge uh, overlap in terms of the uh, different objectives under the e-government and the INSPIRE agenda. So with that, um, I would like to invite to the floor the, the first um, uh, speaker, Mr. Mario Caetano uh, from Portugal. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to present your diagnostic uh, study that we carry out in Portugal. Um, and just to set up the scene, we have our, our national uh, special data infrastructure is called SNIG. And uh, we have it since 1990. Actually, it was the first uh, special data infrastructure in, in, in the world. Um, after the 2007, uh, after the Inspire, uh, the Inspire publication, uh, Inspire Directive publication, we we uh, adapted our decree law, our legislation, and um, in 2014 we created an, uh, a, a new portal, an open data portal. It's called IGEO, and uh, after all these years, so after. 25 years after we have our national special data infrastructure and after six years of um, INSPIRE implementation, we thought that it was time to stop and to think a little bit on um, the state of the art. And so we carry out this uh, diagnostic study and the main goal was to create uh, some uh, uh, reference material to develop a vision, a vision for our SDI that we called SNIG 2020. Uh, so it's a vision for, for the national SCI for 2020. Uh, the diagnosis included three components. Um, we analyzed the temporal data set of the Inspire monitoring <laughs> indicators. We invited all the data producers with responsibilities in Inspire implementation to carry out a SWOT analysis and we uh, performed the online uh, public consultation on the use of our national SCI and also on the perception that people has on the Inspire Directive. You already saw, um, you already saw the, the numbers on the right in the plenary section. So this is the, here we, I compare 2009 with 2015 regarding the main um, Inspire indicators. And as you can see, um, the number of special data sets has increased significantly. Um, we are now have 100% of our data sets have metadata, but we, have, we are very behind in the special services, uh, in, the, uh, in the view services and download service and of course harmonization. Here, just to tell you that Portugal is the, the, the fourth member state with the lowest uh, um, percentage of, uh, of special data sets with view services, and it's the fifth member, sa member state with the lowest percentage of uh, special data sets with download services. 
And in harmonization, we, we are also in the bottom of the line. We have only like two or three percent of our data sets are harmonized. So we are not in a very good uh, situation in Portugal. Um, regarding the SWOT analysis, so we invited all the 29 entities that uh, integrate the core focal point network. So this, uh, this is the network, we, the network we created to um, discuss the inspiring implementation in Portugal. So all these 29 entities have responsibilities on producing data sets according to INSPIRE directive. And a total of 18 entities decided to, uh, to work on a SWOT analysis. Each entity developed each SWOT analysis and then we integrated. And the main conclusions, they are not new, but I think it was important to hear from the entities themselves. And um, the opportunities that they found was that um, there is an increasing need for geographical information. And this increasing ne need uh, comes from public entities, private sectors, citizens, NGOs, so everyone wants more geographic information. So which is good for us, I mean, which is good for data producers. Um, also, there is an increasing need for interoperability. So this means that somehow the, the data producers recognize and inspire an opportunity to create inter interoperable data sets. And also with Inspire comes some technological developments like open software, which is also seen as a, a, an opportunity. Regarding the problems, so the, the, the weaknesses and the threats, um, most entities said that they lack uh, human resources, they don't have the specific technical knowledge, for example, which is very much needed for the Inspire, um, for the Inspire harmonization, and there is not uh, enough resources for acquiring hardware and software. For example, just to give you one, one example, we are now on the harmonization step, and some entities are, 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 are using Hale, which is an open software, but Hale is not really able to deal with massive data sets, with very heavy data sets, and so they have to acquire FME. FME is very expensive and they don't have the money, so we don't know how we are going to solve the problem. Uh, in public administration, uh, in general, uh, we, as you know, Portugal is one member state with a deep financial and economical crisis in the last years, and we have a fragile political support for Inspire. And within each entity, um, the people that uh, participated in SWOT said that there is a lower level of awareness on INSPIRE from the, from the directors and presidents of the institutions, and there is a weak articul articulation among entities. Um, we lack, um, all in entities said that uh, um, there is a lack of policies to promote access and sharing of data. And regarding technical aspects, uh, um, all of them said that uh, um, data specifications are too complex to implement and uh, um, it's quite difficult to, to convert them. Difficult on the sense that they need human resources and they need to understand the technical specifications. Regarding the public consultation, so um, it was open for 17 days. We had 505 uh, uh, people that answer the, 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 the public consultation, which is considered a very good number. I can tell that in Europe, they performed a similar consultation. They had around, in all Europe, around 700. So it's, I think 500 is very good. This is, these are the answers we got. Most of the answers come from the public administration, around 57%, but also uh, some, uh, around 25 came from the academia and research entities. And when we look into the public administration, this, this was a good surprise that we had a lot of participation from local uh, administration. The local administration is not really implementing INSPIRE because when Portugal uh, committed to the European Union uh, uh, um, directive, we said that we will only report central um, data sets produced by the central administration. So local administration is, we are now starting to implement INSPIRE. And um, so it was quite good to have such a high um, reply from them. So this is the very, surprising result, I, I'm, probably it's not surprising, but uh, we were able to, to confirm that when we asked the people, how do you 
discover the data. When you go to Google, uh, when you go to the internet, how are you going to find the data that you want? And 78% of the people said, we go for Google. They don't care about our catalogs. They just go for Google. And 40%, they don't go to our national SCI. To go, they go to the data producers. They already know who are the data producers, and they go directly there, and they acquire the data. 29% went to a new portal that we created in, in uh, 2014, only with open data. So this was, a, I'm, I'm going to talk about this portal later on, but this is a user-friendly portal for accessing data. And only 20% of the people goes to the national catalog of metadata. So this is not a really um, good motivation uh, for us, or it is a good motivation people, we are because we are building things that people are not using it. Now, this was another surprise. When we asked the people, how do you, how do you use geographic information? And 60% of the people said, oh, we just do visual analysis. Uh, we, don't do, we don't use it any GIS. So only, f uh, only around 40% of the people said, we really go into GIS to do spatial analysis. And, um, this was another surprise when we told the people, how do you access ge geographic information? Uh, and, sorry, around 76% of the people said, I want the data stored in my computer. And this is the opposition to Inspire. I mean, in Inspire, the main idea is the data is on data producers and we just access it to use it through services. And as you can see, only 25% of the people use WMES and only 13% of the people use WFES uh, services. This is also a consequence that most of the services, are, most of the data sets are not in services. But the main reason is because people do not know how to use WMES. When, when you go into local authorities, they just don't know. We put a, a WMES of our national land cover land use uh, data map, uh, land cover land use map in, the, in our um, open, open data portal. And you cannot imagine the questions we had by telephone because they, it was the first time that local administration was hearing about WMES. So it seems that for some people, Inspire is ahead of time. So we need to have to spend some time to explain to people what is the new paradigm of using geographical information. That it does not make too much sense to have the data stored in the computer since we can access it through the internet. Most people knew, heard, most people heard about SNIG and Inspire. And again, this 30%, I think, uh, came from the local administration and not from the central administration because there I think most people know about Inspire. And we are, when we ask uh, people about uh, opinions on our national special data infrastructure, um, the people, th uh, so here I have three classes. Uh, I totally agree to the question 19% in green. In blue is the, the middle class and in red it's when they disagree with the sentence. So. Uh, when, they, when we asked them if SNIG was an easy and intuitive platform, 20% of the people said yes, and 20% of the people said no, not at all. So um, I think it's here is more useful to look at the green and red than at the, the middle. So nevertheless, I'm going to, to pass all of them. So uh, people think that, uh, um, that SNIG has the metadata of, of geographic information I need, around 20%, 15%. Now, what I think that was most curious here is that people think, most people think, not most, but 30% think <coughs> that metadata characterizes very well the data. So they think that not all the data has meta, not all the special data sets has metadata, but when it is, when we have metadata, they are very good. Um, and here you can see that the red numbers, they are very clear when they say that they cannot find the WMES of the, of the geographic information they need. 20% and 35% of the WFES. So um, people, we still do not have, this is a consequence that the fact that we still do not have WMES and WFES for the special data sets that people want. So this is the, the most conclusion is that 
20% of the people think that SNIG is not good at all, and 17% thinks it's very good. So we are very worried with the 20% that thinks that uh, SNIG is not good at all. Now, this is, uh, as you heard in the preliminary section, um, we do not have an open data policy. So uh, 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 sometimes some data is very difficult to get. And when we ask people what are the obstacles on geographic information access, 89%, I mean 90% of the people said there is a weak cooperation among public administration entities and um, which, is, which prevents the use of information, geographic information. 80% um, of the people said that one of the main reasons for, um, for obstacles on geographic information was there is not a legal instrument. So there is not a legal imposition to have free data. And of course, that the lack of qualified resources and lack of training, people uh, still need some training to use the data. Um, geographic information is not updated, but, uh, and some people think that interoperability is a problem. So, but I think the key message here is that uh, we need a, a legal instrument for promoting open data in order to reduce the obstacles to access the data. And this was one of the reasons why we created a, a, um, a, a complement to our national SDI, which is iGeo. It's an open portal, uh, open data portal, and it's a very user-friendly catalog. It looks like that. You go there, you just put a keyword, like in Google, and it, it gives you the data, and then instead of going to the very complex metadata, now it gives you, the, you just click in one button, and you have the, the, the web link of the WMS. So, People, and you can see that even though we only have it for two years, um, it has more users than the SNIG catalog. So people, I think people like easy access to, uh, to things. Now, about Inspire. What do people think about Inspire? 60% um, of the people think that principles of geographic information sharing through network services are still valid. And only 3% think that are not valid. Inspire improves access to geographic information. 44% of the people think it's, it is true. Um, Inspire contributes to an open data. Again, 40% of the people. And Inspire implementation benefits are larger than the costs, 36%. So this means that when we compare uh, the SNIG replies, so this is a, a kind of a um, sum up of all the replies regarding SNIG and INSPIRE. So even though people think INSPIRE is the way to go, 40% of the people totally agree that INSPIRE is still valid. Only 20% of the respondents think that SNIG is in good shape. So this means that, and if you go to the red, it's the opposite. People, only 8% of the people disagree that INSPIRE is not good but 20% of the people think that SNIG is not good. So this means that INSPIRE as a principle is very good, but we are still not there. That, that's the meaning of it. And so based on this, we, uh, we, uh, um, based on the results of this diagnosis, we will build up our, we already uh, built the, a vision for our national SDI for 2020, and this uh, vision I will present it in another session on Thursday. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mar Mario, for this very interesting overview of uh, your stakeholders' uh, uh, views on Inspire and the implementation. I would suggest that we uh, directly go to the uh, second presentation, as we are a bit uh, behind schedule. And the uh, floor will be open for uh, another 10, 15 minutes at the end of the, the, the session to, uh, to have questions. Thank you. So uh, now the presentation by Mrs. Catherine Mostat uh, on interoperability. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining this short presentation about interoperability as a key enabler for citizen-centric location-based services. 
The core business of the Flanders Information Agency is exchanging information and data. Data from different governments, the Flemish government, local governments, federal government and the private sector. I want to share our experiences and ideas about our transformation towards a citizen-centric government and the importance of in interoperability. But before we take off, a little introduction. The rapid transformation of our society and the digital revolution, along with budgetary pressures, pose challenges for the Flemish government and the future of public services. The evolution of society requires public administrations to tackle many new challenges, including those around demographic change, employment, mobility, security, environment, and many others. This transformation involved great challenges from a technical, political, legal, and organizational point of view. Our agency has set up a program, Flanders Radical Digital, which wants to ensure that all actors buy into the change process towards an integrated digital government. Flanders Radical Digital wants to integrate the world's inside government, about 80 departments in Flanders, 388 local governments, and the federal government. It involves breaking down silos between different administrations. Ultimately, we want to integrate with the world outside of government and develop partnerships with the private sector. One of the most important goals of Flanders Radical Digital is to create an information-centric approach of government. We want structured information created during digital interactions available for policy making. This way, we want to ensure to help departments make better informed decisions. We need good quality data that's usable for all. We already have a lot of good quality data, but because they've been developed as independent silos, we now need to work on interoperability. Data has to be tagged by metadata and has to be standardized semantically, and we have to know where we can find it using catalogs. Ideally, data are as open as possible, and we are experimenting with linked open data, but as a government, we, had a, we have a lot of personal data, so those have to be correctly secured. Base registries play an important role in, in interoperability. My colleagues will be giving presentations about the registry for buildings and about linked base registries during this Congress. The second goal of Flanders Radical Digital is a citizen-centric approach that makes us start from citizens' needs. The once-only principle ensures that one piece of information or one event has to be reported, created, and managed only once, and all government departments will reuse this information. So citizens don't have to give the same information over and over again. A citizen is not interested in every aspect and every detail of a government service. Citizens often feel drowned in all the information. They want their needs met in the most specific way. They want individualized services or information, and don't want to be flooded with all kinds of irrelevant data. The ultimate goal is proactive government, where specific services automatically are suggested to citizens. A specific uh, situation or need often transcends different agencies or even different governments. This is also a challenge we want to meet by a citizen-centric approach through presenting data and information in an integrated way. Different channels have to coexist, at the least. Ideally, we want an architecture that allows different channels to operate together. Digital channels show many benefits, but channels for direct interaction are still required. Technical and digital evolutions offer new possibilities to create a new digital welfare. In Flanders, three departments merged into a new integrated agency of information. One was responsible for exchanging ge geographic information to different partners. One was responsible for allowing access to privacy-sensitive information to various governments. And one was responsible for communication about all government services from different levels. The different data exchange platforms already allow governments to reuse data in public services eliminating the unnecessary administrative burden that occurs when users are required to supply the same information more than once to public administrations. But with this merge, we created a single point of data delivery, no matter the nature of information or data. 
We call this conceptual data exchange platform that's capable of delivering all kinds of information, Magda Square. This data portal allows citizens and government departments to have a single point of access to all government supplied services and data, regardless of which authority provides them and regardless of the nature of information. An important aspect of this platform is the fact that personal information is secured and follows Europe's privacy regulations. At this moment, local governments, public partners, private partners and citizens are connected to our secure platform, requesting millions of information objects on citizens, businesses, addresses, buildings and their location. This strategy contributes to minimizing duplica duplication of data and associated costs and makes Flemish government ad administrations agile, enabling them to respond better to changes. So, we have this new vision for an information-centric and citizen-centric government, and we have this merge which allows us to combine different kinds of data. This combination led to a new project. At this moment, we are building a citizen-centric portal that will provide a citizen's access to all individualized information and services known to the Flemish government and in time to local government and federal government. This project will realize the idea of a whole-of-government approach in which the public sector acts as one entity. The citizen-centric port portal is a missing link. At this moment, we have a lot of generic information on one side and we have very specific services accessible through specific applications that are provided by specific departments on the other side. The aim with our citizen-centric portal is to provide individualized information and services through the use of smart filters. Services provided by different agencies and departments come together in one portal and in an individualized way. This is an important step towards a whole of government approach. I'll give you some examples of mock-ups of this portal so you can feel what it's about. One of the greatest challenges will be to create a single sign-on. At the moment, we have different systems of user authentication and access control. Our aim is to create a single sign-on as much as possible. Once you have access, you can surf through different ser services without having to identify and access again and again. A very important feature in our citizen portal will be to provide an insight in the information the different governments hold about citizens. For example, data about, about your house, your car, your family or your income. Citizens will be able to give feedback about this data, which will enhance quality of data. The Magda Square platform, which provides all data sets, also provides logging about which administrations are using the data. Citizens will have insight in which administrations are using their personal data. And this will create a more transparent government and a better access of government information. Location-based data will be an important aspect of this portal too. Relying on Inspire services and harmonized data, the portal will use, a personal information, will use personal information to create filters on all the location-based data of the Flemish, Flemish government informing the citizen about the status of his or her environment, for example, air quality, water quality, mobility, and so on. This could be an example of bus stops in your neighborhood or at the location of your choice. We will also make suggestions. For example, Flanders often has heavy rainfall and floods. When this occurs, we will suggest the maps with water levels in your neighborhood or locations of your choice. Flemish government focuses on diminishing the use of energy by citizens in their houses. At this moment, an energy performance certificate for buildings is being standardized. We want to make this type of data easily accessible through the citizens portal. Here you can see an example of an energy score of a building which illustrates its year yearly energy consumption. In order to show this to citizens, a building registry is essential, of course, as an authentic source. The energy certificate of a building is not open data, it's personal data that needs to follow privacy regulations. But as we can show privacy sensitive information combined with, for example, sun panel potential of a roof, which is open data, this makes this portal an informative tool. It will motivate building owners to increase thermal isolation of their properties and to diminish their energy consumption. 
A lot of geographical data is, in Flanders for the greater part, already open and very much available. But we're convinced that this individualized service will make this data more accessible and more usable for citizens. This is an example of noise pollution in a specific neighborhood. Another feature of this citizen portal will be a high-level and standardized view on active government services. A citizen will be able to access his active services through this portal. In this portal, he will see his status of different services, due dates, and so on. As part of the Flemish e-government strategy to enhance and facilitate the communication between citizen and e-government, we will provide um, through multiple media, notifications and alerts to citizens on services of their interest and choice. These services will be updated continuously, providing citizens with their latest governmental notifications. This can be regarding a change in status of an active government service or news about government and so on. To accomplish this project, Flanders has to focus on interoperability on each level, aligned with the principles of the European Interoperability Framework. This framework will serve as an agreed approach to interoperability for organizations in Flanders that wish to work together towards the joint delivery of public services. Within its scope of applicability, it specifies a set of common elements such as vocabulary, concepts, principles, policies, guidelines, recommendations, standards, specifications, and practices. In this project, we focus on semantic and technological interoperability. And because of the different go governments involved, we have an approach of co-creation. Co-creation is key in making this portal work. In order to establish the perception for the citizen that he can access all government services and can find all relevant information no matter where he starts his search, that's the principle of no wrong door, interoperability on different levels is essential. We need to share data and experience and we need to use common standards and architectures. The increasing pressures on government budgets require that we do more with considerably less. So reusable solutions ensure economic viability of this approach. The interoperability program of the Flemish government, Open Standards for Linked Governments, also referred to as Oslo Square, focuses on the semantic and technological level within European frameworks. It will extend vocabularies and standards with local user needs and requirements in order to facilitate the integration of data and services and their implementation in business processes of the public and ultimately the private sector. This will ensure that the concepts can be used in different domains. The governance of Oslo Square reflects our approach of co-creation. We have experts who make the first draft of semantic or technological models based on European standards, and we have feedback loops with partners in and out of government. We will start this portal with a handful of Flemish departments and local governments, but our aim is to have all our partners use our components and deliver their services through this portal from every department. So services regarding environment, employment, welfare or education, everything will be accessible through this portal. speaker from the Slovak Environment Agency. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, as you see, I'm not Martin Tuchina. Uh, my name is Itka Fognerova. Uh, we, I'm from Czech Environmental Information Agency, and as this is a shared presentation about our uh, Czechoslovak approach and Czechoslovak uh, uh, experiences with uh, environmental, inspired environmental data, uh, as we call them, priority data, uh, yes, inspired priority data sets, uh, will be me starting the presentation and uh, Martin will join in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, this presentation was compiled by uh, 
us, Martin and me, but also uh, by our colleagues, uh, Renata Grofova and Lenka Rientova, uh, that are uh, responsible for the reporting part. So, uh, why our agencies here? It's the Slovak Environment Agency and Czech Environment Agencies. Uh, both agencies represent, first, the member state contact point for Inspire and as well also national focal point for uh, the network of IONET. Um, all the presenters here since the beginning of the session were talking about how to make data available mostly to the public. Uh, we also try to, uh, we will also try to show you what we do uh, with making uh, the right Inspire data available, but it's uh, more oriented uh, not to the public use of data, as you uh, as you know, like uh, cadastre addresses, post offices, but it's more oriented to environmental data, but still uh, making uh, data available. So uh, first I would like to explain you because I believe that not all of you here are the national contact points for INSPIRE or you are not from the agencies delivering the reporting obligations. So I will start with explaining what are the priority data sets and uh, we will tell you something about uh, the experience from our countries, how to, how we were able actually to get the uh, right spatial data sets into the INSPIRE infrastructure. But, uh, and uh, we'll have some uh, observations and recommendations to you if you are the one uh, responsible for either for INSPIRE or either for reporting because uh, this uh, exercise or this task given by the Commission is not anything uh, smooth and easygoing. So, uh, what is a priority data set? Uh, shortly uh, said, shortly explained, it's, uh, it's a kind of data which is necessary for environmental reporting. Uh, we have loads and loads of reporting directives, uh, reporting on the environmental uh, indicators aspects and the state of uh, environment in uh, various countries. Uh, just a few examples, noise directive, water framework directive, urban wastewater treatment directive, and so on, and so on. And uh, there in the directive, uh, which we shortly call a reporting directive, you have a list of obligations. Uh, the obligations, well, let's say, uh, an obligation is please deliver us uh, by, let's say, end of the year, uh, data on air quality. Uh, and by the end of the next year, 2017, uh, deliver data on uh, uh, the monitoring stations that monitor the air quality and so on and so on. I'm just giving the examples because there are, um, I would say, hundreds of, uh, of environmental obligations and the reporting, uh, the reporting deadlines. The usually one directive have more obligations with different deadlines. It's repeated every six years and so. So this is uh, a list of uh, reporting obligations. And a reporting obligation can be fulfilled by either a written report, uh, either non-spatial data and spatial data also. And if this spatial data is also relevant for, like thematically to the Inspire data themes, it's this, the priority data set. And uh, by checking uh, all the member states, how successful they are in uh, having the priority data sets, the reporting data sets in their Inspire infrastructure, I don't want to say uh, how the other countries, but Czech Republic, Slovak, Slovakia, we were like partially successful. We were, we definitely don't have all our reporting data sets in our uh, Inspire infrastructure. What's the motivation for that? Uh, first, it was uh, an Inspire uh, refit evaluation where it was actually said that uh, if the reporting data, priority uh, data sets were part of Inspire infrastructure, it would uh, make all the reporting process much easier. And also uh, the environmental domain should be the leader uh, to prove the potential of, of SDI. 
and also this reporting data should be visible through the Inspire infrastructure. So there are loads of motivations uh, on the side of the EU, uh, also environment, uh, uh, sorry, uh, European Environment Agency, I just forgot the whole name of the EEA. And it is also important for us because what we found out in Czech Republic and also in Slovakia, uh, there's nothing like this at the, our ministries, something like a list of these, this data should be delivered uh, for this reporting obligations. These are the people delivering the data. These are the organizations. Uh, this is the like primary contact that you can contact if you need the data and so on and so on. Uh, basically, I would say that uh, based on the lists we were given, uh, by uh, the European Commission to find the data, find the data providers. We started to build these lists, so I think we will we'll use them for our national, uh, for our national purposes as well, not uh, uh, not only for uh, the Inspire obligation. Um, main observations: uh, We are not very happy with the list we were given by the European Commission uh, because first we were given just uh, a general list of things of uh, the reporting directives with their reporting deadlines which is quite okay because if you uh, and that's why there are the two other colleagues because uh, you need a person who can actually enter the, the network of the INET and can uh, enter the which is called ROD which is uh, reporting obligation database, uh, someone who uh, can enter there and find out uh, the exact obligations, the exact uh, data sets needed for their obligation and so this is what you cannot do as an inspired contact point because you, you don't have access to, to this. So uh, if you have a directive, if you have uh, a deadline, uh, it's uh, very useful for the orientation there. We were happy with that. Uh, the, uh, the happiest we were with a list of uh, of directives with a very very detailed and specific dis uh, description of the data sets really needed like which data set coming from a reporting obligation is actually the data set that we want to have uh, in the inspire infrastructures but this was made only for four directives, uh, air quality, urban-based ba urban water, water framework directive, and the, the habitats directive. So uh, this is like a very small part of the directives that uh, and the data we uh, should deliver. Uh, and uh, we were given a third list uh, of directives, which is not the same as any of the previous ones. And, uh, it is very hard to work with them uh, with it, but it's not something that I should like stop with. So our initial implementation experience is that uh, we would appreciate uh, having one list that we could work with. Uh, I think it's very useful and uh, it can be passed to, I don't know, our ministry or to someone who is actually, uh, who is actually coordinating uh, all the reporting in our countries. It can be useful for the, uh, for the EU as well. So we think like we should compile one list from these three and to make something that is uh, clearly visible and uh, usable for, uh, for all the groups of the stakeholders that needs to work with it. Uh, the most preferable for us is definitely a list uh, where we have a directive and a di uh, direct data set that, uh, uh, a direct data set that we can just match to a direct data provide because you wouldn't believe that you know, once you have a, a reporting directive and reporting obligation, there can be two ministries or two organizations uh, del delivering the data. So you need to make a network of people uh, to work with. Um, if we have the reporting deadlines, it's very easy for us to uh, to uh, to work with the the reporting obligation database, and uh, it's also very useful if we have uh, if we had the mapping to uh, the data themes because uh, working with Inspire themes, you probably met. Uh, already that or you actually uh, you were discussing for example with your colleagues or with someone else already uh, which uh, 
where should I put the data set actually? Because uh, talking about bathing waters, let's say it's a reporting obligation, uh, are we in the hydrography or are we in the human health and safety? Or uh, how, should we, uh, how should we decide? And us, as the national contact points, we usually tell the people like what we feel, but we don't know if it's the right uh, reason or if, if it's the right argument for that, for that uh, division. So if you imagine that you're having uh, bathing waters from half of the countries in hydrography and from half of the countries in the uh, human health and safety, that's, that's not probably the result you want to have. So uh, we would uh, strongly appreciate to have at least a discussion about that in the maintenance and implementation working group or uh, to have it somehow uh, driven by the European Commission. And this is the part where I'm going to stop and I'll pass the word to my colleague uh, Martin because he's going to tell you something about the experience uh, from Slovakia. Thank you, Itka. Uh, hearing I have four minutes, let me ask you one question. Who will be uh, somehow affected by this priority data set? Can you raise your hand? Okay, okay. If so, let me uh, give you a very short summary of what we observed so far. Uh, definitely, uh, we, we had to uh, communicate uh, with uh, not only Inspire World, but also with the world of experts dealing with the reporting as already described by ITCA. And uh, we found out uh, sort of, uh, um, I would say, uh, aspects which are uh, related to the, to the points. Uh, ah, sorry, I already skipped uh, one slide. Yeah, uh, which, uh, which uh, I split it to two parts. First, uh, relates to the description of this information via Inspire metadata, because it's very important to realize that till this information is not visible through the Inspire, it's completely disconnected from uh, this part of the world. Uh, then uh, it's very necessary to realize that there we, we would uh, appreciate certain guidelines how to actually describe this uh, reporting information through the Inspire metadata. Here are some points. I'm not going to go into the detail, but this shall uh, actually help member states, but also commission to find out actually what's the status of this process, how many already uh, reporting flows are registered in the INSPIRE and what's actually the process and situation in the member state. Second, uh, very important level is uh, actual uh, interoperability and data harmonization because so far, uh, uh, as we uh, already heard, uh, there is no clear mapping and uh, this uh, makes this uh, communication with the domain experts really challenging. And to conclude, uh, this is really the last slide, uh, we came with some sort of recommendation to both sides, uh, to the member states as well as to the commission. For member states, uh, I would be, and I'm sure Itka too, happy to, to bring from this short presentation two messages. First, let's start to communicate as soon as possible. The second message is really to, uh, to make sure that whatever you will do, uh, document as soon as possible, no matter whether it's uh, perfect or not, even what you were able to achieve and you have it documented, it helps to stimulate the discussion which shall take place on the European level. For the Commission, definitely we will need one single harmonized list of priority data sets, ideally with versioning if some changes will occur. And then we would, uh, uh, we would definitely need to help with this uh, mapping for the interoperability and harmonization. So that's it from our side. Happy to discuss any time during the conference. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. Um, after the technical overview of the Spanish colleague, we now got a perspective from the policy making, the national contact point perspective. Um, I now invite colleagues from the Netherlands um, to present on the best practice to build a bridge between Inspire and end users. Environmental and Planning Act. The floor is yours. Oops.
Hello. Um, welcome. Um, first, the 12 provinces in the Netherlands uh, they decided years ago to work together in the implementation of the INSPIRE directive. And this effort led to the availability of around 16 data sets in the Annex 1 and 3. But by working together, they realized that it was a very efficient and effective way of implementing INSPIRE. Now, the basis is built, it's ready to use, and now they're facing new challenges. For example, the Environmental and Planning Act. Um, it's a new law to be implemented in 2019, which integrates 60 laws about the environment. And the goal is to make things more easy for uh, everybody in the Netherlands. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, develop an activity, you need well, lots of permits to do that. The idea is to get one permit and that uh, the decision is based on an integral um, consideration. Well, that's a huge operation and it demands a lot uh, of the uh, information. Um, before we start, I have a question for you as well because we are going to talk about INSPIRE. Um, I, we were wondering the way it is implement, implemented uh, in your country. Um, well, is it the minimal variant, you know, uh, implementing the required fields, is that enough or is there more ambition to use uh, INSPIRE to enrich it and uh, to embed it in, in uh, working processes? Um, well, can you raise your hand if uh, the implementation is, um, well, we do what is required and that's enough for us? Nobody, so one person. So it means that the rest of you has, have a lot of uh, ambition with INSPIRE. Well, that's good news. Um, my name is Sietzke Postma, I'm a consultant at New Denkers, uh, but now I put myself in the position of interviewer and I'm going to interview, I'm well, going to have a nice conversation with these two gentlemen. And it's Johan van Aragon from the province of South Holland and uh, he's in the position now of the data provider and Ronald van Lane from Royal House Koning DAV, and uh, he takes the role as an end user. Well, we're, let us see what, in what way Inspire is ready to use, but what bridges still need to be uh, built between the solid basis and the use. This is we are. Um, we have a sort of roadmap for this conversation, but my first question would be uh, to Johan. Well, the basis is, uh, is built, the provinces ha have done their thing. Uh, what do you expect uh, of the use of the Inspire data sets? Um, well, at this moment, as you said, the basis is in order. We are more or less compliant with all the, um, the, the Inspire obligations, directives, directive and the data specifications. Um, but what we all, all, uh, also see is that the inspired data sets that we uh, spend so much time on and so much money on. No, oh, okay. Yeah. That we spend so much time and money on to um, uh, put together are hardly used, um, at least of all by ourselves. So that's something that um, we need to think about. And I would like to say, um, elaborating on the, the first um, question to you, that our ambition is to um, have Inspire as a, um, a quality mark and build on it and use it in our own processes. Well, that is uh, very nice to hear, but then I want to know uh, Ronald's answer. How do you qualify at the basis that has been laid by the provinces? Yes, um, as a end user, we use information in the whole process, planning and design for roads and bridges. We are um, a part of a chain cooperation. Um, we have deal with uh, some data, data structure, deal with legal, <coughs> um, finance contracts, construction, maintenance, all kinds of issues are uh, in the work we do and the needs we have. But what we expect, what we expect is um, not um, the data output, because uh, Inspire um, uh, for us is more output, but we need more the outcome of Inspire and Inspire data. Okay. Yeah? 
Okay. And um, we have a little example of that. Um, for the information needs of the Environmental Planning Act, uh, we need uh, availability, usability, and stability, stability um, uh, of data. And you can see we have uh, we need different kind of, of uh, sources, and all the sources can work or not can fit on our question. Um, but we need an information product that is not fit for the information uh, of the needs of the Env Environment and Planning Act. But we suggest that the next step. Inspire still can be used as a platform, as an infrastructure with linked data to get outcome to create a nice information product for our goal. Okay, so there's uh, <coughs> things to be uh, to be done, um, but what you're basically saying is that uh, the way Inspire is implemented now by the provinces is a focus on output uh, and not on outcome. So, uh, Johan, it, it means that there's sort of a gap between what uh, is offered uh, um, and what is needed by the end user. So, what can you do to close that gap? Well, for instance, we have some experience. We have a, a provincial a geo registry in which nearly all of, our, the, of the geo data sets of the Dutch provinces, and they amount to about 1,000, I believe, more. Um, are registered and uh, ready for viewing and downloading. Um, with that registry, we have a, <coughs> um, a board of users and we um, consult them every now and then. Uh, and they give us very useful information uh, about how to develop this registry further, but also to how to make the data more usable for them. And to us, that's um, a valuable asset because that means that we do not do things just because we, well, once decided to do them, but they really are useful. They are used, the data. Um, and something like that should be um, installed for Inspire, I think. Okay, so, well, that's um, sort of a, a chain cooperation, and that leads us to our first lesson that we have learned in the Netherlands. Um, that is... Um, crucial to invest in structural communication uh, in the chain from data provider uh, to the end user because you have to get to know what they need uh, in order to improve or to enrich the inspire data. Um, well, but it, it, it also comes to trust, uh, I guess. Uh, end users must rely on the data that is offered uh, and you can communicate about it, that's one step, but what else do end users need to make Inspire a reliable basis to work with, Ronald? Yeah, what we need, what we need is, um, maybe next uh, sheet, is um, in the whole process, um, actually, um, we lose, uh, lose information. And um, there are examples like uh, uh, building information management or building information uh, products um, uh, for road and, and traffic um, that um, achieve a uh, um, curve that's um, not losing information. And so for every, uh, um, like explore or plan or um, building, um, you can put the, put the, the top here. You can um, um, not lose information and um, uh, Inspire can uh, help us for achieve the, uh, the next level, and that's the life cycle level. So, uh, to keep the information uh, fit for purpose, uh, that's actually we can do. Uh, what, we what, need. what you need, that is what, what you need, because what you're saying that everybody's collecting and using data for their own uh, good yeah. and is not thinking about the next step in the whole process. That's the information loss. Yes. Um, and but yeah, there is a program also um, now uh, uh, working on at Interlink, and they use uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, different kind of, of uh, uh, exchange and share of, of information. Also, maybe they can use Inspire um, to, to uh, collect uh, Inspire uh, uh, data in the whole process. Mm -hmm. So there's a project going on with semantic web and with uh, uh, object type libraries 
to create a European uh, uh, sharing information. Okay. Okay, because end users, they all have the, their own semantics and therefore it's important to acknowledge the fact that there are differences in semantics and not only acknowledge them, but you have to share them and understand each other. We, all sp we speak different languages and we have to overcome these differences and that loss of information that Ronald uh, told us uh, by crea creating, for example, a jointly library. That's also a lesson we learned. Um, then, um, the context of Inspire is uh, European. Uh, it's about sharing information across borders and in context of European reporting demands. But how does that serve uh, local working end users? So in, in the Netherlands, what can the end users uh, do with it, Inspire? I'm afraid to say not too much at the moment. That is why um, <coughs> we are proposing that well, Inspire should be a, a kind of a, um, a quality mark. You know that when you use Inspire, then it is um, <coughs> reliable, it is available, um, it is sustainable, um, it has a legal basis, and um, but we have to build on it. We have to um, to uh, to extend it, and also we should use uh, experiences from um, the the usage of the data to maybe, where necessary, <coughs> adapt the Inspire. Um, uh, rules and uh, so by in that process um, improve on inspire and make sure that it is used and it is I think it's also important to say that um, if also within our processes the, of the data provider um, inspire is used is, is, is maintained next to our own uh, information streams then it is very difficult to keep the attention focused on Inspire and to um, to well keep people enthusiastic about Inspire. So we need to uh, take care that Inspire is used by ourselves as well. As well, yes, and it, um, that's another uh, lesson that um, we have to involve end users in the process of establishing future data specification uh, and use cases like the Environmental and Planning Act uh, be the measure of those specification because. It's a, what I said, it's a huge operation. Uh, lots of uh, geographical information is needed. Um, so it's the, 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 te the test, uh, so to say. Um, Proof of the pudding? Yeah, the, is in the eating. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, but last but not least, um, achieving the milestones of Inspire implementation in the roadmap, <laughs> that is one thing, uh, but it's not ready then. Um, End users have to, tr they, they must be able to trust that uh, Inspire is a trustworthy, up to date, and comprehensible uh, basis for the environmental information. Um, the 12 provinces, they uh, reached every milestone of the Inspire roadmap on time. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the next step? What is needed to, to keep it uh, up to date all the time? Well, it's, it is a bit what I already said. Um, we need to um, to transform or to, to extend Inspire in such a way that we can use it ourselves. The data sets at this moment are very um, poor. I mean, we have, for instance, um, uh, natural... Um, um, well, we have um, um, uh, the nature areas, for instance. Um, we have a lot of information about it, but what we... Um, um, has, have as inspired data set is um, an extraction of it. And it's only, it has, I don't know, maybe four or five um, fields connected to it while we have 20 or 30 of them. And um, if people want to use the data, they ask the complete data set, not the inspired data set. So what we need to do is make sure that um, we can extend the Inspire and use it ourselves. Yes, you have to use it as, uh, yourselves as the provinces, but there are 12 of them and you work together. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, provide one uh, Inspire data set for, for, for nature, for example, for protected sites. Mm -hmm. But how do you keep those 12 provinces like frogs in the buckets? They tend to uh, climb out. But what, what is needed? Well, how do you organize that? Well, um, 
it is really very uh, uh, simple. It um, costs them money if they do not cooperate. I mean, it's, it's cheaper to cooperate. We have um, um, earned, I think, uh, um, maybe millions of, uh, of euros by working together on this uh, uh, whole uh, Inspire project. So that is, uh, that is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, an infrastructure and um, it costs us money, so it's, there is an urge to use it and to reuse it. And, um, well, at this moment, there's uh, still enough um, energy to, um, to work To keep on it, it going yeah. and to, to regulate the, the governance um, of uh, the Inspire data sets. Well, that is uh, our last uh, lesson <coughs> for today, um, that it's good organized and durable maintenance of the Inspire data sets, uh, while it's needed, it, it is crucial to make Inspire successful. If this is not properly organized, end users will lose their faith in, um, in the insp in Inspire data sets. Um, I will thank you for this um, interesting conversation. I will thank you for your attention. Um, I have one question. Jon has one question for you, not for me, I guess. You all have the ambition to, uh, to use Inspire as more than just uh, an, an obligation from, uh, coming from uh, Europe. Um, but are you also willing to, to um, um, share experiences and how to, to use Inspire in a wider sense than just to, uh, to meet the obligation from Brussels? Um, can, I say, uh, can I see fingers? People who want to, to, uh, to share experiences, how to, um, to extend in, in Inspire <coughs> to more than just the obligation. Anyone wanting to? Ah, I see Slovakia. That's it. Everyone keeps it to himself, herself. We're here at the conference, yes. so you can speak uh, to us um, next days, maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for that very interesting uh, presentation. Um, now the floor is open. We still have, I think, a couple of minutes. Um, if you want to address the speakers, um, yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm just sad for, from the last because it's, let's say, very fresh, uh, very interesting still in our minds. And I have two additional questions that could be had this, uh, to these interviews. So, uh, a question that it's hard to, to be answered uh, so far during all these years. What does it mean, an inspired data set? And I'm sure if each one of us are trying to give an answer, probably we find some diversity in the answer. Because at the end of the day, all of uh, the discussions, or main part of discussions is related to what is a data set, inspired data set. What we have, I mean, I give a piece of, my, let's say, my answer up to you then to, 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 to debate. What is in the current regulation is what we call the core data set. And this is the minimal that is, uh, let's say, admissible to us as an obligation for member states to provide. We are conscious that this is not enough. It's far not enough for any application you want. This is a piece of a, kind of a piece of a Lego where you can have let's say, extend according to what is your uh, application in mind. And uh, for me, it, it, so it comes with that, it, with that, that a data set, it, probably what is in the core data set in certain occasions could be not all necessary for a certain application. But you need a piece of other uh, core data set that is associated to a different team, put together with the other piece and create your new data set. In your case, when you extend your data set for the specific applications like you are explaining, we are creating another Inspire data set. The, the main thing is that providing that the rules of interoperability are kept. And then we are always talking about Inspire data sets. So my interpretation for debate. The question for you, which I'm not going to answer is, in that context, if someone asks you what you see as a necessary measure for simplifying the interoperability, what is your first reaction? What to simplify 
uh, how to deal with this question. Um, it's a difficult question uh, to start off with. <coughs> um, we have had some, some use cases in, in the Netherlands in the past, um, I don't know, one or two years, uh, in which, um, well, there was also, um, um, it, 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 it's all centered around uh, a permit, but a complicated permit for a, a factory, um, an extension of a, of a factory. And a lot of governments were um, involved, uh, a lot of regulations were involved, and um, the question was, can we, with the Inspire data, um, answer the, the request? Can, can we grant a permit on the basis of, of uh, Inspire data? The answer was no, not, not to our surprise, but um, this use case um, gave us information about what, what is still missing, what do we need to, to, um, to add to the, to the, to the Inspire data sets in order to be able to, in the future, to, uh, to handle uh, this permit request. Um, and I think by, using, by, by doing that, um, having more of those use cases, um, I mean, you cannot um, adapt Inspire to every single um, question, to every single uh, problem that arises. But there is a, a kind of, um, I think, um, well, a general need for, for information in, able to, in, uh, in order to be able to, in this case, um, to um, grant a permit. So there is a kind of um, general level of information that, um, well, we could standardize, harmonize, and um, extend inspired up sets with. I mean, at this moment, I don't know more, um, um, anything more specific to, um, to say about it. user it has, it has to be accepted uh, in practice I think it's more theoretical uh, what, we, what we talk about a lot of time and uh, and in the processes in the process we, in the roadmap we uh, uh, we show you that it has to be accepted in practice and then uh, like um, the colleague of Belgium uh, talked about agile I think we can agile um, um, create a, a better product or better uh, uh, um, da data set but maybe we uh, can choose for an uh, object type library and not only data sets. Uh, I mean, it's, it's about the outcome, what uh, uh, has to be done and focus on only one data set is difficult, I think, to, uh, to, um, to stand uh, in, 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 in the future because we, the, um, everything's changing every minute. Just one proposal, maybe it would be good to initiate the competition, which team will prove in the next two, three years the best results in real uh, use cases where this team was applied, just, just for curiosity. And actually we are having, yesterday we had a discussion about the connection between the INSPIRE and for example e-government and open data movement. And I have to admit that uh, last year I was receiving from discussions with open data people comments that uh, actually for time being inspired they perceive as a blocker for their initiatives because it is legally uh, limited and but uh, these days we are actually based on this discussion getting a change of the position because uh, through open data initiatives they they've got for example at least in Slovakia indication what would citizens like to see as a which kind of data but uh, very often these data uh, are not uh, harmonized uh, based on the structure. And Inspire here can help uh, to bring this initial, uh, let's say, level of data sets for this kind of requirements. And hopefully with this concept of extensions, uh, these use cases could be supported in real life. Okay. Um, any further questions from the audience? 
And if that's not the case, I think we uh, come to a, a close of this uh, session. Thank you for the uh, excellent presentations and the uh, excellent uh, snapshot overview on the main challenges from the user perspective, from the data provider perspective, from the policy making, the uh, national contact point perspective. And actually what we can see is, um, what is really important is that we have reliable data under the Inspire infrastructure with a easy to use, easily accessible uh, service that is available to the public so that they can actually uh, harvest and use the Inspire infrastructure. So uh, what we could see from the, the Portuguese uh, presentation is that uh, you know, if this is not the case, if there, is, uh, there are shortcomings in terms of this uh, ambition level, the easy access, easy use, then you know, the, the answer for the user will be Google. So um, as we, we could see, see there. And actually, as it was mentioned, um, the uh, issue of uh, resource uh, 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 necessity and resource needs, um, it is really important that we position, I think, um, Inspire in this e-government digital single market framework because there are lots of possibilities, EU funding available to, to, uh, to, to make the next step in the implementation of, of the Inspire directive. So for instance, under Horizon 2020, there are calls for, for um, 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 platforms, for, for instance, flood, flood management of uh, related data. So, um, so I think that it's, it's really, really a key, key issue to look out for these funding opportunities under the digital single market and also under the specific environmental uh, area, for instance, Life Plus. So with that, uh, we come to a close. Thank you for, the, uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>